Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Hugo Fillion, who's the co-founder and CEO of Flare Networks, as well as Justin Trollope, who's the CEO of Pangolin Exchange. Gentlemen, it is great to have you both on the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Pleasure being here. Thanks for having us. Well, there have been some very big updates around the Flare Networks. And also we have Pangolin Exchange, the, the decentralized exchange launching on Flare Networks. Uh, so lots to talk about. But Hugo, I would love for you to start us off and set the table here before we talk about Pangolin. What's new with Songbird and Flare Networks? So um, Songbird's been operating well since it launched in September 2021. I think we're now at uh, close to or possibly exceeded 40 million transactions, which is uh, quite nice. We've got, a, I counted yesterday, we have 143 FTSOs, so those are data providers. Um, so we have 43 over the cap um, of 100, um, which means we think that it may well be um, the most decentralized price oracle in the space. So we're you know, really, really sort of proud of what we've achieved with the FTSO so far. Um, and we are working quite feverishly to um, on a way of making the FTSO faster, so it updates more quickly, more scalable, so it has more prices and can have, handle more um, price providers, um, and even safer. The pricing of the FTSO has been amazingly accurate. Um, if you go to the FTSO monitor, uh, you can see how, how um, close the prices are to the major exchanges. Um, we're, we're very pleased with that. So Songbird's operating well, onboarding uh, more projects. Um, obviously, the, the biggest thing that we will do with Songbird and indeed with Flare um, is activate uh, the F assets and layer cake when, uh, when they're safe to activate. Obviously on Songbird first and then Flare afterwards, Songbird being the canary network, Flare being the main net. Um, and then really the last thing about Songbird is a, a sort of, um, I suppose an update in our thinking about um, what Songbird you know, can be also used for over the long term. Uh, and I think I've mentioned this previously, uh, but I will be delivering at some point when I get a moment to actually sit down and write and I'm not on phone calls. Um, I will be delivering a um, governance proposal uh, that means Songbird is the first step in governance on Flare. So to try and give you a little bit of uh, detail on that, in order for a public governance vote to happen, uh, so a, a vote coming from the public, not from the foundation. Um, the, uh, a public governance vote would happen only after it's won a staking round on Songbird. Mm. So um, uh, there would be essentially a round every, say, three months, so quarterly, where at the end of that quarter, one or two proposals perhaps um, get voted on by Flair. But before that happens, people have to stake their songbird to those proposals. So that's sort of my the evolution of thinking of where we want to go with where we think it's clever, you know uh, worth going with Songbird. Um, Flair launched on July the fourteenth, mm -hmm. uh, which is Bastille Day in Europe, um, and I believe on the largest supermoon of the year, uh, which was a sort of thirteenth. Um, in, in the US. So it was the 13th in the US and the 14th in Europe when it launched. So it's quite auspicious, I think. Um, and it's in a mode that we call observation mode. Uh, this is where the foundation is running the validators. Uh, we are onboarding uh, FTSOs who are going to become the first set of validators on Flare. The network will exit observation mode on the later of the 5th of September, or if, if the network is not fully decentralized by the 5th of September, at the point where the foundation no longer controls more than 33% of the validation power. Uh, this is because we're doing essentially one of the largest token distributions in history. Mm. supported by every major exchange. 
So every major exchange has agreed to distribute that token. Many of them have agreed to list it. Uh, we want to make sure that that is done with a fully decentralized network and that there's absolutely no barriers to um, the exchanges getting that token out as quickly as possible and listing it as quickly as possible. So observation mode first, as soon as we exit observation mode, the public token distribution will begin and we'll be off to the races. Uh, that's exciting. And I noticed also that you have a developer adoption program in motion now, uh, getting more folks to come build on the Flare uh, network. Uh, can you tell us about that program? Sure. So if you think about Flare, it's a um, smart contract platform, a scalable smart contract platform with two sort of unique attributes to it. The first is an accurate and highly decentralized price oracle that you don't have to pay for. Um, and the second is something we call the state connector, which allows Flare and indeed Songbird also to come to consensus over the state of another blockchain. Uh, that provides a very, very rich substrate for developers to build products on, both products that live on Flare or products that live on Flare but are enabling interoperability elsewhere. So it's, it's quite nice. Flare can have its own ecosystem, but it can also be used separately away from its ecosystem as a substrate for securing cross-chain uh, activities. And so we think this is an extremely rich um, area for developers to engage in. And so we've launching a developer program with the foundation. Uh, the first sort of aspect of that is grants. We have Pangle in here today, thanks to that grants program. We will be releasing a formal grants program uh, sort of quite soon as part of that developer adoption program. The second is, uh, you know, grants, investments. Uh, we will be spinning up an ecosystem fund uh, with, you know, tokens out of the foundation and out of our corporate vehicle to invest directly in developers coming to the network. Uh, we'll also be seeking to raise money in, in that fund, you know, cash as well as tokens. And then obviously we have a, a we're hiring at the moment, you will have seen, uh, looking for a, a really great, you know, head of developer relations. We want to have hackathons and we have essentially four streams that we are looking to sort of work in. DeFi, interoperability, you know, gaming and metaverses, and then consumer focused applications there. There's some very interesting potential to have consumer focused applications that are sort of unrelated to the kind of money sort of uh, Legos that we've been building for the last couple of years in this industry. Um, very exciting. And I, th I think a lot of folks um, are excited about uh, all the, the, the launch, of course, and then the building that's happening. And just a couple of days ago, there was an, a press release about uh, your partnership with Metropolis World, uh, a metaverse uh, platform, I believe it is. And tell us a bit about that. And uh, do you expect to have more uh, metaverse type uh, builders on, on the Flare network? The Metropolis world is really interesting. It's started by a filmmaker and a, a music producer. And their concept of metaverse is sort of slightly different to the concept that we've seen existing, you know, currently, such as Decentraland or, and, and such. So they have six cities in their metaverse. And you don't, you don't come into the metaverse and, and get an empty lot. Uh, each each city is sort of built out and you can have bespoke aspects and each property that you buy is hand-drawn. Um, and it's it's sort of putting design of the metaverse, uh, you know, first, which I think is quite uh, a fun and novel way to do it. They've managed to gather really very, very strong support. Um, a lot of, you know, very interesting people, both from the arts world um, and from the crypto world and from elsewhere, music, musicians, um, actors, you know, all those kind of people. And I think they, they, they stand a really great chance of making a really, really nice product. We're very excited to be their partners. And, and their goal is to be, uh, you know, an interoperable metaverse. They, they don't want to be attached to one chain or another. They don't want to be attached directly to Web two and not to Web three. So they're a huge. They're, they're they're interoperable first, and this is where Flare's 
ability to handle cross, you know, complex and uh, you know potentially risky cross-chain interactions uh, by creating bridges with insurance uh, is 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 of value to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Hugo, before we jump to Justin uh, to talk about Pangolin, um, to confirm the roadmap uh, for the remainder of the year, you mentioned going full decentralized, um, having a decentralized setup, and then the, the token distribution, anything else that uh, we should be aware of that may be on the roadmap? Absolutely. After the token distribution, um, there will be a governance proposal mm. um, that will uh, if passed, change the way the token is distributed such that uh, the remainder of the distribution is distributed only to those who delegate to the Flare Time Series Oracle. So distributed monthly to those who delegate to the Flare Time Series Oracle. Uh, there are a lot of very good reasons for that that will be outlined in, a, uh, in the full governance proposal when it's released. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, when Flare launches, comes out of observation mode, it'll be fully live with the Flare Time Series Oracle, and it'll be fully live with the State Connector. And what that means is that straight away, developers can start building applications that are pulling State from other blockchains, pulling State from you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, hmm. XRP, whatever, building an application that does something with that State and that price. For instance, uh, you know, a good example might be a, a cross-chain swaps protocol. Um, so that's available on Flare immediately from day one. And then we will enrich that experience for developers by bringing the bridges to Flare, um, F assets and layer cake. So you'll have a, a, a really amazing development platform with price, state and tokens from everywhere else. So that's that's where we want to end up. That's the roadmap. Can't say it's just going to take this year. Uh, it's probably a multi-year project, um, but that's that's kind of the vision. Awesome. Uh, that that's exciting. Uh, Justin, we'd love to jump to you. Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about yourself very quickly, and then uh, dive deep into Pangolin. Yeah, sure. Um, so I come from a traditional finance background. I jumped into crypto full time about probably two years ago. Um, and the way I transitioned full-time into crypto was as part of Pangolin. Um, so really Pangolin is a community-driven project that was launched originally on the Avalanche blockchain. Uh, it was bootstrapped by Ava Labs, uh, which is the foundation behind the Avalanche blockchain. And then uh, it was a completely fair launch. So 95% of the token distributed to LPs and 5% of the token supply distributed to an airdrop. So there was no team allocation, no VC allocation, no treasury. Um, and then basically Everlabs wanted to hand it over to the community. Their intention was always for it to be a community run DEX and project. And of June of 2021, the community voted me in with two other members uh, to lead the Pangolin project. Uh, we've been running it ever since as a, a DEX on Avalanche, and we've done over 16 billion in volume over the course of the last year and a half. Um, and yeah, and uh, now we're very excited to kind of spread our wings and launch on Songbird and Flare. Uh, that's that's awesome. And, uh, you know, common questions folks will want to know about is, uh, you know, what makes Pangolin different or unique uh, versus mm -hmm. other decentralized exchanges? And of course, security, uh, if you can tell us a bit about yeah. that. Of course, very good questions. Um, so, so, so you, you know, there's always a proliferation of DEXs, especially uh after you saw uh, Sushi, after they started, you know, DeFi Summer, after forking Uniswap, and you, and, and you see it throughout any kind of ecosystem. So what makes Pangolin unique is we're kind of multi-chain by default, whereas mm -hmm. a lot of DEXs focus on a purely one chain. I think this is where we align very well with, you know, Yugo and their team's philosophy of connecting everything. Uh, we want to, so originally we were a uni fork. Uh, we've subsequently rewritten the entire code base to make us multi-chain native. Now that's actually a lot more complicated than a lot of people imagine because of all of the different standards and you know there's no real standardization in crypto so 
we, you know, from the base, what we want to do is we want to provide a viable alternative to centralized exchanges. Some of the biggest uh, issues currently is moving assets and tokens between blockchains. This is where, you know, a lot of people are forced to go through centralized exchanges because there's no ways to easily kind of move between these blockchains, especially if you're a trader or if you're a farmer and you're trying to, you know, uh, take maximize your profit making opportunities, you, you're forced to use a centralized exchange. Um, so really, you know, with this partnership and, you know, with our approach, we envisage eventually centralized exchanges will be kind of like a remnant of the old world where most people will move on chain and it will be much easier and seamless to cross. Uh, and that's part of our vision. So yeah, that, that that's what sets us apart. Uh, and then in terms of security, we're incredibly security conscious. Uh, we, we don't release a single uh, contract without a full audit. So generally numerous audits. Uh, so uh, the, the thing with security is it's a multifaceted beast that we need to look at, right? So often what will happen is on crypto Twitter, you'll, you, you'll see a lot of... Um, comments that that lack a certain nuance uh in terms of this industry audits are great but if you go look at the rec leaderboard they're definitely not a silver bullet so you can get audits but you also actually have to have very strong internal security policies so you know one of those things that we do which which you know, sometimes can be construed as a little bit against the ethos is we make sure that like people that contribute to our, our code base are KYC'd. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so like you'll see when Sushi had an exploit a while ago, someone, um, you know, approved a PR from a malicious actor and that opened up an exploit. Uh, Curve's front end was recently exploited. So, you know, while we are very, you know, embrace the ethos of decentralization from a security perspective, we do kind of lean on the side of paranoid, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the KYC, yeah. we have very limited, um, you know, permissions across the code base. Uh, we have all of our contracts audited. Uh, we generally deploy on a canary network first. We try to get the community to test, you know, we do a bunch of stuff, you know, the more eyes on the code, the better. Unfortunately, it's not a perfect world in DeFi and exploits do happen. Um, but, you know, everything we can do, we, we, we will do to ensure safety of our users' funds. Yeah. Um, and, and that's good to know. You, know. you mentioned your team, they get KYC'd, uh, which is, I don't think I've ever heard anybody <laughs> say something like that. Um, but th th that is very cool. And, uh, you know, I love the the feature, the interoperability feature that um, you're not unique to one chain. I think that's pretty great. And I'm assuming, um, you know, given, and Hugo, you could weigh in here too, the different assets that Flare uh, Network support uh, supports, um, will you, is the plan to scale to those different networks as well um, eventually? I mean, this is the beauty of State Connector, right? It allows us to do really cool stuff with those, you know? Um, so our plan is like, like I, I always talk about it like the McDonald's of DeFi, right? Wherever there's a chain, we want to be there. Um, and that's really our approach. Um, now with the, um, launch, th there was a, if I'm not mistaken, an airdrop of, uh, flare pangolin tokens that are involved mm. in there. Can you tell us about that? Who can participate and what are the ins and outs? Definitely. Well, when airdrop, it's always the most common question, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so there's 4.6 million, uh, of the tokens that will be airdropped. Uh, so, so we, we, we kind of, the initial thoughts were, um, so we, we, we've got the initial airdrop, which is based upon loyal pangolin users. So if you, so what we've done is we've taken an average since the entire time pangolin's been in operation and we take an average between everyone's wallet. So if you uh, held PNG, if you stake PNG, or if you were a PNG uh, LP provider for PNG AVAX, you're eligible. But what it does is we've we've taken a snapshot on every day and then given you an average. So based upon your average, so how loyal you were over the course of the last 
think it's about 18 months, you'll get a wait in and that will then determine your airdrop eligibility. Um, now, the thing is, when we actually announced that, a lot of people said, well, what about Songbird people? What about Flare people? Yeah. And we actually thought that's actually a very valid question, right? We want to come into this community and we want to be good citizens within this community. So we've had a lot of kind of internal discussions and we're like, we've got to give Songbird holders a bit of love. So we're busy building an indexer, which will take a snapshot of everyone that is delegated to an FTSO provider, and they will get uh, a portion. It probably won't be live on day one, just because we have to build up all of this infrastructure in order to derive those contract addresses or the wallet addresses. But we do want to get, we, we will be giving Songbird holders an airdrop there. Yeah. Oh, that's great news. I'm, I'm sure the folks listening and, and watching will be excited to hear that. Um, that is awesome. Um, for the remainder of 2021, um, what's on your roadmap? I, I know you mentioned quite a few things there. Anything else that we should know about? Mm, we're actually got an, a, an entirely new DeFi primitive, which we're launching. I think it should be live on cost and either, either this week or next week, which is the test net. Uh, and it will go live on Songbird. So what we it's called Sunshine and Rainbows. Um, and it's really it's so so one of the big uh problem points for DEXs or, or centralized actually all exchanges really is sticky liquidity. So we've seen kind of these approaches to how do you make sure that your liquidity providers actually stick around, mm -hmm. that they don't just kind of move their capital and they become mercenary capital. And mm -hmm. the common market approach is V uh, tokenomics, which stands for vote to scroll. It was popularized by Curve and has been adopted by numerous other. I mean, it's very in vogue at the moment. We're not particular. Th 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 there's some negative connotations or ramifications of V tokenomics. One of the key ones is bribes naturally occur, which kind of distorts it and it becomes a whale game. The whales tend to dominate and the small guys kind of get like, left with nothing so we've introduced like our take on this it's not a v because it's not actually uh anything to do with votes but what happens is you get rewarded based upon how loyal you are so if you look at like let's say there's a thousand dollars to be earned and you and me both um you know are, are farming that but i i came in a month ago and you came in just today i will earn a significantly higher proportion of that $1,000 rewards compared to you because I've been there longer. So mm -hmm. we reward people based upon how long they keep their liquidity. Uh, and that's and then you get like an NFT, which represents your position. So that, that that's going to go live on Songboard, which we, we're very excited about. Well, that's awesome. I, I love the NFT idea uh, to, uh, to show you your respective position. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah. And we're hoping it all like on the secondary market, people can also trade it. So there might be like a secondary market. Um, I have a question for you, and both you and Hugo, and, and this may be tough to answer and, or maybe it's simple. Um, look, we've seen a lot of exploits, right? DeFi and, and what's been happening with different folks. You mentioned Curve just recently. Um, is it just that we are in DeFi 1.0 and there needs to be iterations and, and better technology. And obviously you guys are building and trying to, to do that. Um, but you know, what would you say to the skeptics who are like, see, look at all these exploits, look at all these things that are happening. Is this legit? Is this for real? Um, what, what would be your response to that? I'm happy to go first on that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, when we look at things like bridging, you know, tw about 21% of the problems in bridging, 21% of the exploits um, or the, the, the value of the loss has been related to code issues. So this is essentially, this is the team that's built the bridge have created some form of, you know, code issue, which has allowed an exploit. That means the other 79% is related to structure, mm. right? So if you look at say the Ronin exploit, that was a structure of the bridge. Sure, there was some code issues or some, some issues in the way they secured their infrastructure. Someone could essentially um, uh, hack into their infrastructure through, I believe it was a, a phishing email. Um, but ultimately, the infrastructure problem should not have led to the hack because the hack should not have been possible 
because of the bridge design, but the bridge design was very weak. Yeah. Um, this is what we're trying to solve with our bridging. And I can't comment too much on DeFi unless you assume bridging is a DeFi product. And in fact, Flare is kind of extract, abstracting bridges as a DeFi product. Um, but what we're trying to solve very, very succinctly with what we're doing is the structure of bridges. We believe that the layer cake structure for smart contract bridges is potentially when we compare it to other structures is the least risky structure in the market mm. that still leaves code risk on the table, right? If we can still screw up the contracts, but we also think that the way people develop in this industry often is sub suboptimal. Uh, as, as Justin said, you know, they, they do their development cycle and then they do a audit, uh, you know, to tell you how audits work, you usually get two to three weeks. Um, and it's, it's a small team, two or three people that audit your code in two or three weeks. You spend a year, two years, whatever it is, developing it. And you're expecting people to audit essentially a massive code base that is complex with lots of different logical operations in an extremely short time. So they've got to get their head around the structure, the theory, everything, sure. and then audit the actual underlying code. I think that's too big of an ask. So as we build out layer cake, not uh, our community will have noticed that we've been through many audits. I think we're at eight audits at this point with our code base. But specifically, as we build out Layer Cake, we will be engaging the auditors, and we have engaged the auditors from day one. And so, instead of having that three-week, uh, you know, rush or sprint at the end of the contract build, what we actually want to do is have the auditors with us the whole way through, so they understand the theory first, and then each module of implementation and we think that that may be a safer way to do it can't guarantee it that's why we have songbird that's why we have a canary network use it at your own risk once it transfers to flare that's us saying we think that this is now in a position where we think it's uh less risky you and know I'll, if you I'll, go I'll, as you explain that it's like uh a lot of these things are common sense, but you would think other chains, other folks would do that. And, and it totally makes sense what you did with the Canary Network. And then, as you mentioned, having those auditors part of the process. Uh, well, a lot of people have chosen the option and possibly correctly um, to go for, to, to win a product category as quickly as possible, like in the Web2 development stage. You know, I want to be the Uber of X, right? I want to be the, the, the people that creates this, this uh, platform. Uh, that, that has served some people well. Uh, other people's businesses have, have and will entirely fail because they rush to market. Uh, you know, you've seen bridges, you know, uh, you've, you've seen quite a lot of bridges that have gone down and, uh, you know, it's not, uh, they're not necessarily coming back up um, or they're, they're not used so much anymore. So, um, uh, we're not proponents of rushing to market just to secure market share. Yeah, uh, that I, I think that is the wise decision, uh, the wise approach to, to take. Um, Justin, I don't know if you have any thoughts on on that as well. You know, with maybe what the critics may say about DeFi and and where we are at this stage. Yeah, I think I think it's 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 one of the key things. I think we're at like a, a turning point. I think you're going to see some trends emerging. Uh, one of the trends I think you're going to see emerging is freezable assets, or you know, as regulators enter the scene, th there's going to be this push, and they're going to justify it. So the thing is, if we don't get our house in order, someone else is going to come in and put our house in order. Um, so we have a responsibility. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's a hard thing because, you know, we, we're trying to legitimize this industry and we're trying to bring it to the masses. And we need to do that in a, in a good way as good custodians of our ecosystems. I think that's a major trend that we're going to see. And I think the other major trend we're going to see is you're going to get alternative VMs, which that their narratives are going to be we're safer, we're safer. Ultimately, when people on Twitter say that they're the best or they're this, generally it's only after time that you know. Um, but what I think will happen is if the EVM continues, because the EVM is quite complicated. So the more complicated a code base gets, the more security vulnerabilities are introduced. Mm -hmm. So I do think we're going to see viable competitors and the one that ultimately can prove a safer 
bat, a playground will will have a I think we'll get a good market share. For sure. Now, um, you know, you mentioned crypto regulations and, and there's been a lot going on. I know you guys are not in the United States, um, mm-hmm. but there's regulations being discussed globally, right? Different governments and so forth, mm-hmm. especially in the UK as well. Um, we just had the US Treasury sanction tornado cash, and then they've been kind of uh you know trying to figure out what they're gonna do or how they're gonna regulate DeFi. So let's say one of the governments came knocking on Hugo, your door saying, Hey, tell us about Flare Networks. And we want to make sure that you're, you know, Flare Networks is being used for the right reason and so on and so forth. How would you guys, and this may be a difficult question, how do you guys approach that and and to find that balance and say, well, hey, part of this is DeFi. We're not able to share anything. We don't know who the users are and so forth. How would you navigate th- those questions? So I think it's really important to say, you know, we're obviously not building anything with any, with any intent for it to be used, you know, for anything that contravenes regulations. Right. So that's, that's, that's straight out of the box. Um, you know, we are obviously proponents of decentralization strong proponents of it. Um, often I, I think about decentralization less about it as just like a, a goal and more about it as, you know, if you look at say bridging, the lack of decentralization in bridging has caused losses. Um, if you can build something, you know, hi, that is highly decentralized, uh, it has a better chance of being robust. Um, and so, you know, and and to, to to put it in another way, an ex- extreme centralization that that really started this entire industry in in many ways. You know, when when um, Bitcoin was launched, you know, off the back of the financial crisis, the losses of that centralization continue to this day, and have completely changed the global economy in the last you know twenty years. So, um, you know, there is a real reason to have decentralized economics and decentralized you know a, a, a decentralized economy um so obviously we would collaborate with you know we would obviously have to work with regulators um where we can um obviously in DeFi, we don't know anything about you know the we don't necessarily know anything about the underlying users but there is you know a huge layer of ancillary services you know such as amber data chain analysis and all those various providers who are, I mean, I think they're even used by the US Treasury and various things who track those kind of addresses. Um, we obviously can't blacklist addresses on the blockchain because we don't control it. That's pretty much the point of us exiting observation mode. You know, we no longer control the blockchain. Um, and But we certainly wouldn't structure anything such that it could be used for, such that it was intended to be used for nefarious purposes. So I, I think there's a, a, a very dis- discreet, you know, very strong separation there. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, it's it's just this ongoing conversation. And I guess we also have to educate the regulators and the government officials. And I know that's a process. But, but uh, uh, and again. to be clear, like I really welcome regulation developing mm-hmm. in an environment where enforcement is only through an agency, um, which is potentially setting case law mm. without any public oversight right so you know case law is not decided by you know the case law becomes precedent but it becomes precedent through judges and, and, and those kind of things it doesn't become law through you know the democratic process um, some may argue that that whole thing is democratic but you know you you have a far more limited set of people involved in setting that precedent if you're only um you know going with the sec and the courts than if you know congress and you know the government actually make a law about it so we would be utterly delighted if there were some laws made such that you know people who are trying to build in this area and i think it will become an area of national you know vital national importance at some point um have some some you know clear rules because it's it's you know 
everything you do, you have to ring up a lawyer and spend $50,000 to figure it out, right? Like, oh, can I breathe in this direction? You know, it's, 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 it's literally like every tweet, every tweet we put out goes through a lawyer. And that's a, a huge, that's a huge expense for a startup. Yeah, that, that is ridiculous. Um, and to your point, uh, you know, I've spoken to some of the regulators and politicians here, and I'm, I'm hoping they could move faster. We're seeing more members of Congress and, and getting bipartisan support around crypto regulations, but still moving at a snail's pace. Um, with that said, though, uh, you know, with the token distri- distribution for Flare, uh, you mentioned the major exchanges will be participating. W- uh, was there any hurdles that you had to kind of jump through as a result of the you know, lack of clarity in the United States with U.S. exchanges, um, or is everything so good? We, we had to spend a vast amount of money having legal documents drawn up that, uh, you know, made the case that the token is not a security. Wow. And we had to supply those two exchanges. And, you know, we did that because actually for our own purposes, we don't want to, you know, we really don't want to fall foul of the law. Um, you know, otherwise... You know the project, you know, and and our, our large amount of work that goes into it, obviously, um, you know, would would be would struggle. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And and look, I, I know certainly you're not the only one, right? It seems everybody's got to face this and uh, navigate these these uh, waters without without the clear rules and regulations until they get them. Um, so we covered quite a lot of items. Is there anything else that you, uh, Hugo or Justin you would like to highlight um, that uh, we didn't touch on? I think I'm 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 good. Um, I mean, you know, we're very very heads down at Flare, just shipping, uh, getting the product right, um, and building out Layer Cake, which is uh, quite a fun process. Awesome. Uh, well, Hugo, Justin, pleasure chatting with you both. Excited for all the updates and uh, the future updates. And you know, as things progress, we'll love to have you both back on to talk about them. But thank you for joining me today. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks.